Okay. Welcome everyone. This is session one of the LIDAR special interest group. We're excited that you're here. Just a couple of reminders. We are going to be using the Q&A for questions for our presenters. The chat will be sort of monitored, but if you have questions for the presenters, please put it in the Q&A. Um, I'm excited to have you here. Mark, I'm gonna hand it off to you so you can start introducing our fabulous presenters. Sure, thank you. Uh, welcome everybody, this is always exciting. Uh, I know I always enjoy the LIDAR uh, session. Um, I think there's always some very interesting stuff. So we have uh, two absolutely amazing presenters and then I'm doing a third presentation, which you know, I look like a hack next to these guys. So, um, but I think it'll be fun. Uh, you'll get to see me tripping up on some other stuff too. So, uh, but uh, first up, we have Drew Decker. Drew is the National Map Liaison for Arizona and Southern California. He's worked for the National Geospatial Program with USGS since 2007. He works with uh, local, state, and other federal agencies uh, to coordinate mapping production, maintenance standards, and planning in support of the national map. Uh, Drew has presented for us a number of times. It's always really great. Uh, Drew, thank you so much for being here uh, and take it away. So. Okay, hello. Yep. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Jenna. I'm just gonna share my screen here and we are going to share screen two. And I'm presenting now. Okay, everybody see my uh, my screen? So, okay. Um, my name's Drew Decker. I'm the uh, National Map Liaison for Arizona, just as Mark said. So I, I work with folks in cooperative-based mapping projects such as elevation. And our elevation program here at USGS is covered by the 3D elevation program, or 3DEP. I'll give you a little uh, presentation on the program in general and some of the aspects of it on how it affects Arizona. Um, so what is 3DEP? Well, it is a program to collect new national LIDAR from IFSAR, IFSAR uh, radar data set up in Alaska, to create a whole new national baseline of consistent high resolution elevation data. Okay, so this is a new topographic base for the country and replacing stuff that we have had for a long time based on, for example, older DPMs, topo maps, and uh, other older um, low resolution products such as that. You can see by the bullets here, we're doing this again, national. We are looking to uh, realize a return on investment by partnering with a lot of other agencies. We have expected business uses that are coming up here in the, cent the central part. You can see how we expect to use the, uh, the data will be used, that is, as well as expected benefits too. What is LIDAR? Uh, that stands for light detection and ranging. And that's essentially an airborne laser in this case that overflies terrain and scans very rapidly and uh, creates a very dense point cloud. Everything that we collect with LIDAR is just a point with an X, Y, and Z component. It's quite accurate, it's very dense. You can do a very good, accurate uh, depiction of what's on the ground, recording everything on the ground surface as well as the uh, buildings and anything above, anything else above the surface, such as uh, vegetation, towers, anything that between the aircraft and its sensor and the ground. So from these points, we can create a whole bunch of different pro uh, products. I will show a few of those here. Uh, you can see the bare earth DEM in the top center here. That's uh, a very commonly used, uh, easy to use and work with product. The LiDAR point cloud, again, this is the, the raw data that we collect and it can be uh, classified and, and further refined a bit. You put them together, sort of, you can see the LiDAR profile of what the sensor is actually collecting as it overflies the terrain. So we, there are a number of applications that uh, 3 depth will support. We know this because we did a, a study a few years ago um, to collect information on on the uses of LIDAR, how it will be used, expected benefits to help justify the program and, and see how it would fit in with what we're, uh, what we're proposing to do. 
So there are numerous applications you can see here, uh, flood risk management, infrastructure, forestry are among the, the, uh, the, the largest uses. So the products, I mentioned a few of these. The, the DEM is a digital elevation model. Again, this is a grid surface. Every grid cell will have one value. Um, in this case, though, the, the cells are pretty small. They range from roughly half meter on the side to one meter uh, based on the, the resolution we use. And so they provide an awful lot of detail. And you can see the progression here up to one meter. Uh, 10 and 30 is what we've traditionally had. So this is a much higher resolution now to, to read out. I mentioned Alaska earlier in the IFSAR sensor. It's a five meter resolution, but compared to what we used to have up there, which is 60 meters. So this is a much higher resolution product. So looking at the, the lighter point clouds, uh, again, the points are the raw material. That's everything that the sensor collects. See a few different uh, interesting collections of data seen by the cloud, represented by the cloud. That's the downtown Chicago in this area. Uh, Mesa here is shown in fine detail with vegetation on the sides of it. And speaking of vegetation, we're looking at an area affected by fire. We collect LIDAR before and after the fire. You can see uh, get a very good picture of what was affected and, what, and to what degree, looking at before and after not only the vegetation, but the landforms too. Did anything change due to the debris flows, for example? Drew, I'm sorry to interrupt. Your audio is kind of wonky. It might help to turn off your video. That might help the I'll audience. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Thank Let's you. hope that works. Yep, that's better. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, let me know too if it continues to be uh, a problem. Um, so behind 3DF, we have uh, a number of agencies that we work with. So it's kind of a group that works together on the program to help set the direction and strategies. From the list of agencies here on the right, a lot of these are folks who work in Arizona. And of course, across the whole country, BLM, Forest Service, NRCS, Fish and Wildlife, uh, National Park Service, um, as well as uh, National State Geographic Information Council, so it's state, state geologists. So a number of people have uh, voices in this and how the program is managed. Okay, uh, so what we do to generate data is work with um, a process to collect information from partners, both at a federal level and at non-federal partners, and we can partner with them in different ways. Sometimes we'll work with federal partners directly, just have an interagency agreement, and work that into a new project, That's both a plan as well as a project that we can then apply. More and more things go to what we call the broad agency analysis, which is an annual vehicle that uh, accepts proposals and funding uh, for, for, from us and from other non-federal as well as federal partners to for proposed projects. So it's publicly announced, um, it's competitive, clear criteria, include federal agencies, and you can use our uh, contractors or your own. And so this is how we, we do much of the work here for, um, for 3DEP. You can see the, uh, the extent of 3DEP on the right of the map. The dark green areas have are past projects. The light green ones are current new projects. So there's a, a lot going on here. And again, we're going project by project. And uh, some of the things I just mentioned you've seen here in the bullets, these are the different groups we can work with. National map liaison, such as myself, can assist partners with the process and coordinating uh, partnerships. A selection criteria, these, this is posted on our site. It's, it's pretty clear and it, it shows some of the basic things we look for. We want to collect the whole country. So we're interested in areas that don't have any data so far or data, areas with old, older data, or less resolution data. And, um, Larger projects are also helpful too, since we're trying to cover an awful lot of territory here. And some of these other things we list here, project cost and cost sharing and the, the technical approach. So these are all spelled out and people can sub submit a uh, proposal 
almost any time uh, the BIA is open, usually for most of the fiscal year. We have um, some other sites and resources to help with this. C-Sketch is one of our uh, partnership generation sites, lets people put in information about areas they want to collect. This is a little area of Arizona. You can click on some of these areas of interest and look by agency to see who's interested in what and, and when. And that can help put together uh, partnerships. Includes point of contact information. Okay, so we also look at working with states and we're working with the uh, National uh, State Geographic Information Council district to work on state plans. We goal is to have state plans for, for all the states. Arizona's got a plan, many other states do too. And so we put them all together and we, this is what we hope to have. Again, it's a complete project and complete data for the country. Uh, building on this, we have some other resources for federal best practices, how we make a project, getting the, the uh, uh, information from our partners, getting agreements signed, having a logical point of progression and how we put the project together. On the state side of it, we're not going to get anywhere without working with states. We work with NITRIC and all of the state agencies on, on that side of the house. And uh, as a matter of fact, there are a number of resources NITRIC making available to state profiles, uh, the state plan information. Uh, we talked about resource libraries and uh, they have some working groups and um, other um, online activities. Um, looking at the, the partnerships in general, you can see over the year the, the amount of funding, how it changed, um, generally increasing the last year to have gone down a bit, it looks like, in terms of funding, yet we continue on to fill out the, the entire country. Alaska here with its uh, head start is, is done. Um, Data are available for, uh, for all of Alaska. And we have data available too for the other parts of the continental US that have been completed. Um, operational infrastructure, let's go back to some of the resources we have. We have information on the broad agency announcements. These are the contracts we have GIPSI, Geospatial Product and Services contract. We have an inventory, let people find out what's, what's available, what projects have been done, and information about the data. We have this base specification. We have a source of the data. So we distribute it once it's generated. We also have other uh, resources such as a new LiDAR Explorer, which lets you look at LiDAR data within the cloud. Uh, LiDAR base specification, um, this is the site for that. It, it's gone through a number of iterations. But this the latest info can always be found here in LiDAR spec. And it, has information on the deliverables, the quality levels, and, and a whole lot more. Speaking of LiDAR quality levels, back in our earlier study, we had found that what we call quality level two or greater provides data that will work well for, um, for our program. Uh, quality level two is described as a minimum of two points per square meter or more, and vertical accuracy not to exceed 10 centimeters. Q01 extends this to eight points per square meter, and even a QL0 now, which is a newer quality level, uh, doesn't so much increase pulse density, though you can do that. Uh, it increases the vertical actually up to five centimeters. We have specifications on all of these. Uh, looking at the future, though, uh, since we are now midstream and collected much of the country, so where are we going to go from here? Well, besides just completing the project, we want to look at what direction should we go in. So we started something called the 3D Nations Elevation Requirements and Benefits Study to see where we should go in the future. We're already covering inland topo, but what about other things that we want to look at? For example, we, we want to include in the future near shore beaches, offshore. Okay? These don't really affect Arizona so much, but we also want inland bathymetry, and that certainly uh, can benefit Arizona with, with the lakes and rivers. So down here, it says results will lead to a completely new approach regarding quality levels, research, frequency by geography, products offered, other changes. And we've worked with 
the state of Arizona and a number of um, participants in 3D Nation. And that should be coming out uh, the full published for long. Speaking of the future, a lot of people have asked, well, what about UIS based and ground based surveys? We're working on that too. So we don't, we don't have multimodal collection like this yet, uh, multi platform, but we're aware of it and we know it's coming. So we can build that into the, the future of the program. Uh, another step at the future here is looking at the uh, integration of hydrography and elevation because they're uh, co related. And we're looking at perhaps generating more uh, hydrography from, uh, from LIDAR and from elevation. And so uh, that can be something we begin to work on in the future as well. And as we work with the, uh, with the hydro, we can start looking at other things, maybe connection to groundwater, uh, engineered hydro as well. Uh, inland bathymetry, I uh, mentioned that before. For uh, We have rivers and streams or a number of pilot projects in other states uh, none in arizona right now but th that could change and so we're, we're gathering information here again uh, on a case-by-case -case basis in the bathymetry here uh there's a little list of some of the the groups that would benefit from this much of it is really state agencies and, and then federal agencies and then local and uh, a number of activities that identified a need for this, so they're, they're quite a few. Accessing the data um, from our, our site here at nationalmap.gov 3 dep you can access the data and tool to, to get to a number of different places to get services, to download the data, visualize the data. And I'm always able to help with any questions on that. And to kind of wrap up here quickly, uh, this is where we are in Arizona right now. Our little status map shows green as projects that are uh, done. And we recently uh, declared, I think the uh, Cochise County project down here is done. We're looking at getting the data out to partners. These areas in tan are uh, projects that are in work. Some, some started uh, sooner than others, but they're all underway. And maybe through the, the VA, which is now active, we can see if uh, there are gonna be other new projects coming in. Whenever I find out about those, I put them on the map and label them kind of in a rose color. So let them know if these are new pending projects. And finally, uh, a little map of where the liaisons are shows the areas that we work with. So I'm in California and sort of Southern California and Arizona, and we have folks all around the country who uh, do the same thing I do. And I think that is it. And here's my contact info. Again, if anyone has questions about finding data or partnerships, just let me know. Oh, I can go back. So I think that is it. Perfect timing, Drew. Wow, you brought it in right at 15. Okay. <laughs> Great Ooh. job. Yeah, I was afraid of going too long as usual. Cool. Uh, I Last I heard from Jenna, there were no questions, but we'll just pause for a sec in case one last one hops in. No, I think, Drew, you did an excellent job. I think you, you covered it all. Well, well, thank you. Yeah, we'll, we'll see if any come in at the, by the end. Okay. Thank you all very much. Perfect. Cool. Thank you so much, Drew. We really appreciate mm -hmm. it. It's always a great overview and a great way to start off our LIDAR sessions. So. Very well. Um, Okay, we're going to switch over to me. I'm actually up next. Um, before I jump on, though, I was going to mention that this session is being sponsored by Merrick Serdak. Uh, we always like to give a shout out to our sponsors. They're a big part of what, magic, what makes AJIC happen, and we always appreciate when they step up. So uh, thank you again to Merrick Serdak. Uh, okay, let me see where my presentation disappeared to. Uh, where's the screen over there. Okay. I think everybody at this point kind of knows who I am. Uh, if you really want to know more about me, there's a bio up on the website and uh, I appear in many 
TikTok videos because my daughter likes to sneak me into them. So that's my my minor claim to fame. So, <laughs> um, okay. So uh, I'm Mark Cristiano, GIS coordinator for the Kaibab National Forest. Mark, and what's up? I'm sorry, you are not sharing anything. Really? It says it is. Hold on. Thank you for jumping in on that. How about now? That's perfect. Perfect. Thank you. One last button to click. Too many things up. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. Uh, again, um, Mark Cristiano, GIS coordinator, Kaibab National Forest. I'm also the co-chair with Jenna of the uh, Adric LIDAR work group. Um, and today I'm talking about landscape level individual tree mapping on the Kaibab National Forest. Uh, okay. This will be kind of a whirlwind tour of a lot of different thoughts and ideas and a troubling tale of how I try to map trees. Um, so what is individual tree mapping? Um, basically, it's the idea that with LIDAR, you can see individual trees. So here's one, here's one, here's one, here's one, that kind of thing. Uh, what the idea is, can you put a dot on every tree? And would you want to? So uh, here at one to a thousand scale, you can kind of see the trees clearly and their height. The basic idea, and I want to take a moment to thank Arthur Crawford from Esri. These are all kind of screenshots that he had sent me. Um, when you try to map a tree, there's a lot of questions that come into it, but ultimately what we're trying to do is put a dot at the top of the tree, and you can see the lines coming down and gauging that height. You then also have to figure out, well, where is in the tree are we going to be? Um, are you hitting the very top of the tree? So typically one of the ways to tackle this is you take your LIDAR, just see your hair on the left-hand side, you cut off the bottom 10 feet, you create a digital surface model, and then weirdly, you flip it upside down. Uh, then you use the flow direction tools that are in Esri, and you generate, you find the sinks of uh, the trees. And that hopefully gives you that top of tree concept. Um, now there's, Pros and cons to this, uh, you see on the left-hand side with the points, you might hit a telephone pole. Your tree may just be weirdly shaped, so you're not really getting the center of the tree. Different types of trees do different things as they spread out. They're not all nice Christmas trees and the occasional power line. So there's issues in trying to calculate this. But if you manage to get a point at the top of the tree, you can then do like NDVI on that location. You can calculate slope of tree. You can even attach the elevation points to those areas and gauge the height. So there's a lot of benefits to doing this. Um, the problem is, is that then you're sort of faced with, well, how do I do this? And there's a bunch of different things out there. Uh, Esri and Arthur have designed trees from LIDAR tool, which is fun to play with. Um, but it's got some kinks to it and, you know, uh, processing speed can be an issue. The U.S. Forest Service has developed Fusion, which a little claim there is it's fast, efficient, and flexible. But I'll be honest with you, if you don't know how to command line, Fusion really is not for you. I struggle with it. I, it you can visualize the data, but honestly, it's really hard when you actually try to manipulate it. And then if you've been to any of and Dr. Andrew Sanchez Metters, presentations, you've probably seen the LiDAR R package. But if you don't know how to R script, that can be a major challenge too. You have to spend a lot of time learning R and then learning to manipulate the LiDAR R package. And that's tough too and pretty time consuming. And so we're searching for, you know, how to make this work. And okay, so what amongst all these problems, what is the specific problem? The biggest thing is if you don't have a supercomputer, processes crap out after with large data sets or they take days and days and then die. And it's just hard to, to really get to this stuff on a large scale, which is what we're talking about here with the Kaibab. So what do we want? We want to search for the quickest way to map the whole forest on a basic computer without its failing. And the big thing, as I say at the bottom here, it's a numbers game. You're going to see in a little bit that the Tucson Ranger District generated 24,000 polygons. And in theory, if it took one second to process each polygon, it's something like 6,000 hours of processing time. So you have to be really careful what you're asking your computer to do and how can you do this. And so with all these barriers, we were sort of searching for something that anybody could do. And to give you an idea of the scope, that's the Williams Ranger District, Bill Williams Mountain, and you just see the millions of trees out there. 
So how do you tackle finding one point and generating millions of points over the treetops? So, and then I think the other really important thing to also, when you're doing this kind of stuff is to stop and ask why. Um, why would we torture ourselves with this? And to, I'm sure I'm misquoting our keynote speaker from a few days ago, but he had a great concept, which boiled down to, I think, meet your users where they're at. I can't hand a bunch of silviculturists and timber guys fusion or the LIDAR package or a tree tool and say, go figure it out. They'll just be like, no, I'm not gonna do it. So you have to meet them where they're at. And all these people want is just a layer or a point layer of a bunch of trees with heights. That's what they can do. They can then pull that into their workflow. And I've said this in a, in a variety of different states because it was given to me early on in my career. If you make someone's job harder, they're just not gonna do it. They're not gonna use it. So part of why we, I, we challenged ourselves to try to map the whole forest this way is because we think this will help our users do better in managing the forest. Okay, so in comes the function chain, which is just awesome. It's also called the raster function. Now I hate when people put large amounts of text on screens, that's just really boring, but I'm gonna try for a sec here. Raster functions are operations that are applied on the fly. Instantaneously, it happens. And so the raster functions work with memory and calculations um, as the imagery is displayed. And so the big takeaway is the last sentence here. On the fly processing is faster than geoprocessing and does not take up disk space. And if you remember from that slide of what is the problem, the problem is I don't have a supercomputer and I don't have a ton of disk space. So all of a sudden the function chain became very, you know, uh, became a great possible solution to this. Um, this is just more of a definition about how you can use it. But again, the last sentence, and part particularly useful for users who do not have enough processing power or disk space to conduct geoprocessing. So this simple little thing on the screen right now is our function chain. And again, thanks to Arthur Crawford, he came up with like 99.9% .9 of this. I'm just taking the ball and applying it to the Kaibab but he showed me how I could effectively use the function chain. And that's what I'm gonna kind of show you guys today. So we're gonna take the QL1 LiDAR data um, for the, the Kaibab and, hold on one sec here. Um, and I'm gonna zoom into a spot. This is Tucson right here, right? This is a spot I've grabbed. And you can see the forest and you can see the, how the LiDAR sort of pops out the taller trees. This is what that same area looks like just in Nape, just so you guys can get a sense of that. Um, and then just for fun, I colorized it because it just looks a little cooler than grayscale. So we're zoomed in at one to thousand here. And what we're gonna start by doing is in ArcGIS Pro, you bring up the raster function. And I hadn't seen this before. Arthur showed this to me, it was very cool. And you go and find focal stats. And what you do, is when you click on that, it gives you this tool on the left-hand side here, right? And what we're gonna do is push our raster through the system. We're gonna do a circle searching with a three radius and we want the maximum. We want the top of the LiDAR data. And when you run that, first off, it happens almost instantly, in your table of contents pops up this new layer that you can then play with. And from there, you create something that looks like this. And I realize it looks like a giant mess, but basically what this has done is it's gone out and sort of made the trees more seeable to the computer. We've, we've used the focal stats to help draw out the trees. And you can adjust this number here a little bit. Um, if you went to like six or nine, you would get less trees kind of thing it would be looking for. But for the Kaibab, we thought that the three was good. Okay, so then once that happens, when you go back to your catalog and you right click, suddenly edit function chain pops up and it's something you can actually manipulate. And so when you click on edit function chain, this little interface shows up. Now, for those of you who are like, but Mark, this happened in ArcMap, you could totally do it there. Yes, that's true. This sort of existed in ArcMap, but it was really confusing. It was sort of this weird stacking system. In Arc Pro, ArcGIS Pro, Esri turned this into a uh, more of a model builder kind of interface. Okay, and so you just start dragging things in. So from there, the next thing we did is we did a remap. And what this allowed us to do is basically pull out the ground, right? So anything that was from negative 5,000 to two meters, 
we tossed out. Now, if you threw a, if I brought in a silviculturist and a timber person and a wildlife person and said, hey, what's the definition? What's the smallest thing that is a tree? They would spend the next seven hours arguing about it. So some people will tell you that a tree should be three meters tall or two meters tall or one and a half meters tall or whatever. This is where you would manipulate that. For purposes of my work, I've decided that two meters makes a tree and everything under that is a sapling. I'll leave that to others' great minds to argue about, but that's where we're at with this. So we then chop off uh, basically everything that's not a tree. And that's this blue area in here, right? That's the old raster behind it. The new part is now in front of it, okay? Okay, so then what we do is we take that remap and we minus it from the original raster data set, right? We just pull that out. And this is a great thing. We're just building this along. It's all happening on the fly. And each time you just simply push the little play button and it refreshes itself. So now we've isolated, because we subtract the two, we've isolated the individual trees and just their little piece of the canopy. So we're starting to get that sort of canopy look again, right? So then, we remap it again, and really what we're looking for, because we subtracted it, we're looking for that very thin slice, negative 0.1 to 0 0.1, and that output becomes one. And this, what this does is it isolates the little pixels, the very tops of the tree, the pixel in the canopy height model that is the top of the tree, right? And it pulls it out for us. And so we're halfway there all of a sudden, right? We've found the dot, so to speak, but it's still in raster form. But all of this takes like 20 minutes. We have bypassed all of that geoprocessing, all those different layers, and using the function chain, gotten ourselves all the way to here. Now, at this point, it gets a little more laborious. Um, you have to then get it into an actual point, and we got to go back to out of raster into points. There's a couple things that we do. And one, there's a big problem here too, right? In that which dot is the correct dot for the tree, okay? So is it this one or is it this one or is it both? And what do we do about this guy over here? And so I found a tool called the region group tool, which basically goes through in a raster format and tells and identifies which pixels are connected to each other. So what it says is that, um, oops, sorry, this pixel is with this pixel and they should be together. And it creates a table that says that these two are connected. So now after using the region group tool, I can do a raster to poly. I can then take that raster to poly and dissolve on it. And then I can turn it from a feature to a point. Now that's easy to say in about four seconds, but the reality is, is that takes a long time, especially the dissolve. I haven't found a workaround for that one yet, but the point was, is I was able to run it and I was able to get a final output. And then you take your feature point and using the extract values to point, you then pull the elevation or the height of the trees into your points. And it ends up looking something like this, right? So we've got our little dots, we've got our polygon. And from our polygon, we tell it, hey, find the center. And we create a dot, which is that tree. So. What do we do? We made millions and millions of dots. <laughs> so here we zip that out. And you can see I sort of swiped it and took a screenshot. You can see all the little dots on tops of the trees. And then after that, you can see we ran it for all of Tucson. And so we ended up with 24 million trees, reasonably well mapped on the Tucson Ranger District with a minimum of effort, no supercomputer, and using the raster function chain. So did this accomplish what we wanted it to do, going all the way back to the beginning? Did we put a dot everywhere on this landscape? I think so. I hope so. You know, there are some final closing thoughts because I'm sure I'm close to running out of time here. Um, function chains let you skip ahead, and they're great and they're easy to use. Um, the ArcGIS Pro version is much better, much easier to use than the ArcMap version. It's still not super fast once you leave the function chain. 24 million trees takes time. And function chains can't do everything. For example, the region group tool is a raster function. You technically can bring it into a function chain. But when I tried it, it completely died. It just killed the system. Another thought is that I have a lot of LiDAR data for post fire. I've been using this technique on fires, which are smaller, 70,000 acres, but it's still smaller compared to the whole district and it works great. I'm able to map the whole thing in a matter of hours, which is leaps and bounds faster than what I've been dealing with some of these other systems. A couple other things to keep in mind when you do this kind of work, 
Uh, the relationship between height and DBH, diameter uh, breast height of the tree, it's that sort of circumference around it. There's a correlation, but it's not perfect. You are only getting the height of the tree. Anything you do after that's a model and you're kind of on your own with that. There's also some problems if you're trying to understand more about those trees. Young trees can be just as tall as old trees, and that can be difficult to figure out as well. And then finally, is this the right answer for what you're trying to do? I did this for someone in a project and they turned around and said, hey, that's really great. Can you give me trees per acre? And I said, well, I just mapped every tree. Why do, you, I, why do I have to scale it up back to trees per acre? And that's ultimately what they wanted. So is this an effective way to look at the landscape? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. What I can say is I do think this will meet uh, my users where they are at. And I think this is something that'll drastically help our forest. So we're giving it a shot and that's where we're at kind of thing. So cool. Thank you very much. That was my whirlwind tour of a crazy project. So that was awesome, Mark. Holy <laughs> cow. A lot of work and really insightful. Um, <laughs> it, I just think it's awesome. Uh, cool. So there are a couple questions. Um, Ishana Ray would like to know if you would be able to supply the workflow for this um, for tree points. Absolutely. Um, I think that's something that uh, I hope to produce like a white paper from this. I'll be honest with you. I was still processing some of this data like 48 hours ago. <laughs> so it's still a little rocky. And what I don't show you is the tons of scrap paper on my desk of possible different routes. And I think that might also be useful so that you guys can see what I tried and failed with so that you know not to go down some of those same uh, paths. So yes, uh, I hope to produce something and maybe put it up in our new LIDAR uh, page on the, the hub. So yeah, that would be great. Um, okay, so we've got a couple more questions. Um, and I want you to answer them really quickly. And we'll do what we can. Um, we need you've got three minutes. Got it. Um, 42. <laughs> will this process work on photo point clouds? Bodar, sorry. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, I'm just going to have to go with I don't know. I haven't tried it, and Fodar is ultimately subject to the uh, pixel resolution. So if you've got 60 centimeter resolution, which is NAEP, probably not. If you're using drone technology, which is three centimeters, maybe. I haven't tried it. Um, I think that would be a great experiment, and I'd love to take a look at that. Awesome. Um, did you ground truth the results? And if so, come up with a confusion matrix. I have not, as I said, we were still processing it. However, we installed over a hundred LIDAR plots when the data was collected. So I have the plots to do that. And I think that'll be our next step is to take a look and do some sort of uh, analysis on this. What I might do in one of our future LIDAR work groups, maybe I'll represent this uh, with a little more scientific rigor behind it and the plot data for our user group. And of course, everybody will be welcome to come and see. So. That's excellent. Um, okay, and finally, how easily could this method be applied to other areas in other forests? I think it would be easily applied. Um, really, the answer would go to Arthur Crawford because it's his technique, but he didn't base it on ponderosa pine. So I think this is very applicable probably everywhere. Um, is the, the core starting point is that you have a canopy height model. If you don't, then you have to do some steps to create that. But I think this could transfer quite easily to other forests. Last caveat on that, LIDAR is great at mapping big trees. It's terrible at mapping small trees and it does the ones in the middle kind of okay. So um, but I think that I would love to try this out in, in other forests uh, in the country. And I think we would have uh, good results. I think you just have to temper your expectation of accuracy a little bit, so. Yeah, I think that's great. Perfect. Um, would you like to, yep, yeah, exactly. There we go. <laughs> I saw you already going. <laughs> uh, let me just stop my thing on this side. Okay, so our next attendee, give me. Okay, um, our ne next uh, presenter, I'm really excited. I have not seen him present before, but I, I think it's gonna be a great presentation. Dr. 
Dharmapur. Um, he's from Sanborn. Uh, extensive <laughs> credentials. He has a master's of science in physics, another one in technology, and a doctorate in satellite photogrammetry. Uh, he has over 30 years of experience in a wide ranging uh, areas with the geospatial industry, most notably with LIDAR, photogrammetry, GIS, and UAS. Uh, he supports various technological initiatives that are currently, uh, current Sanborn is doing um, as a resident scientist. Uh, he worked, has worked in both private and public sectors, as well as internationally. Um, and he is very active with ASPRS, both as a certified photogrammetrist, a certified mapping specialist in LIDAR, and a licensed photogrammetric uh, surveyor in South Carolina and Virginia. And let me tell you, being a surveyor in two states is not easy. Um, so we are excited to have you here, doctor. Uh, please take it away. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for the introduction, and uh, I hope uh, uh, you are seeing my screen as well as my audio is clear. Yes, on both. Okay. So let us, uh, since my the previous two speakers have you know strictly adhered to the time, so it is uh, it, I need to follow the my predecessor. So let me straight away so, start with the presentation. the The topic is uh, buildings capture from imagery and LIDAR and the associated challenges. Um, so the, the, the agenda for the presentation is uh, just, I will give you a quick overview of uh, my company and experience and uh, why is that we need to collect building data, what are the data source and what are the pros and cons, the level of detail, that's one of the critical uh, component of this presentation and what is the creation process. So that's the broad agenda for the presentation. So quick overview on the company. Um, many people are aware it's one of the oldest mapping company over 150 years in business, uh, involved in various technologies, both the photogrammetry as well as LIDAR UAS, and also it is vertically integrated. So we, as a company, we are an end-to-end -end mapping company. Uh, we do our own data collection. Um, we do the database design and implementation. We finally, after processing, we do the data dissemination, hosting, and viewing. And finally, one of the important thing is the change detection. Um, we have developed some in-house tools for that process also. So this is a broad uh, a milestone or a historical perspective for my company starting from 1866. Uh, began as a ground survey company over a period of time. You can see every milestone, which I'm not going to read. Um, so we have been, you know, we are all, we are progressing along with the new technology whenever it comes starting in 1998 LIDAR, 2004 large format cameras and 2012 oblique imagery. So this is a sort of a progression of my company over a period of time. And coming back to the, the experience within the state of Arizona, these are all the various projects we have done, both imagery and LIDAR. Um, so we have a sort of extensive experience of working uh, in, in the state of Arizona. And uh, as I said, we are a 100% uh, mapping company with uh, full-blown uh, data acquisition capabilities, multiple sensors, four digital cameras, um, you know, three LIDAR sensors, and so on and so forth. So with that uh, overview of the company, let me come to the main uh, topic of the presentation about buildings. Uh, you know, the buildings is one of the buildings are one of the key uh, piece of information within the cadastral information. And it is also very fundamental to urban planning and policy make making. Almost all the critical infrastructure, whether you call it public transport, electricity, water distribution networks, or postal and delivery services rely extensively on the, on the buildings, especially the building maps. So what what are the <clears throat> so the what are the different types of buildings? You know, this is following the 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 old structure. You know, there are five levels of um, detail. We the, we call it as LOD zero to LOD four. The LOD zero is a two D footprint. LOD one is the extruded building. LOD two is the is a sort of extruded building with roof type, and LOD three is the full architectural features, including doors and windows, etc and LOD4 is interior modeling. The diagram, the, the, the figure here shows, this is LOD0, this is LOD1, and two, three, and four. We will see how the level of effort changes when you go from LOD0 to LOD4. 
So in any building capture, whatever be the level of detail, there are two important parameters we need to address. One is the geometry. The other one is the texture. So that is the more two critical thing. But you know, the texture is something that can be added because it improves the aesthetic value of the product. But the geometry is very, very critical for any building capture, regardless of the level of detail. So predominantly, uh, people have been using the studio imagery. It is very highly accurate and detailed, but very labor intensive, labor intensive uh, to capture 3D buildings. And now we can use the same oblique imagery also to, to capture the buildings. And the aerial LIDAR is another source of data for capturing buildings. It's more automatic data collection, but less in detail. So predominantly people use one of the three data sources and obviously there are other sources are also slowly coming in. And now let us go into the, what is the level of details and each one, what it, how, how far it is different and what is the level of effort that we will talk here. As I said, LOD zero is a standard 2D building footprints. That is something all the people who are involved in the geospatial side handle day in, day out, predominantly captured from the auto imagery. It's a 2D with the X and Y values. There is no elevation is involved. Whereas LOD one is primarily, we put the highest point of the building, the elevation information is added to the building. So we can call it as a 2.5D and we also call it as a sugar cube. And uh, you know what you're seeing here, the two figures, the left-hand side is primarily the LOD zero. The, as I said, it's a simple X and Y. And this is LOD one, which is with the elevation added, a single point elevation has been added. Please note that in both the cases, it is only showing the geometry. There is no texture has been added. And now, when we talk about the buildings, as I said, there is a, I explained that there is a very labor intensive. One of the things that we have been trying like every other uh, people, uh, the, the, the use of deep learning methods for automatically extracting the buildings. And you know, the, the three definitions are given here, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning. And this has been, um, uh, you know, especially the, the deep learning based models for feature extraction is the topic of, um, uh, you know, is, is, is the, the topic that has taken, you know, everybody's, uh, everybody is focusing on that. Uh, we tried uh, the deep learning model and what I'm showing here, the three images, Primarily, what we want to convey here is, you know, you can see on the leftmost image there are you know, densely uh, dense of buildings are there. That means more number of buildings are here, and it's a sort of moderate dense buildings in the middle image, and it's a very sparse buildings. But what we have noticed is that in the case using the deep learning based models, we were able to create the buildings in an automated manner. And the model has worked fairly well in all the three areas, whether it is the density is more or it is medium or it is less, regardless, we were able to get some good results, which is a very positive sign. The other important thing is the shape of the building. And what you are seeing on the left-hand side <clears throat> is a irregular shape of building. And even the deep learning model was able to extract the, the irregular shape building uh, correctly, which is again a positive sign. However, when you do any automated building, there is always a chance of getting into some false positives and false negatives. And this is one classic example just to show you where a tennis court has been captured as a building. So which is obviously, you know, when you, as I said, when you use any automated methods, you need to go through the process, you know, fix the problems like whatever we are seeing here and make sure that, you know, your data is accurate. That is what we did. We fine tune our model, improve the, uh, the building capture so that we get more accurate buildings. And this is another example just to show you that, you know, uh, there are two, two things I want to show you on the, on the top left images, top left and the top right. The, the, when, we, when we use the model first, you can see some of the buildings were not captured, which is one of the, the problem that we observed. But after fine tuning the model, we got this right hand side image, the blue polygons, and you can see almost every polygon is captured, which is again a positive news. And the bottom slides, uh, bottom images are primarily to show you, not only you need to get the building captured, but also the, the shape of the building should align with the imagery. So in the initial, in some of the cases, we got the red line, the geometry is good, but it was not aligning with the, with the shape of the building, which again, you know, over a period of time, we were able to perfect it. Now you can see the geometry is good, the blue line, but at the same time, it sits well with the imagery. So this is another way of, you know, in a more automated way of capturing the buildings. And obviously, whenever you use any automated method, one of the first question you will always 
we asked is what is the accuracy so we have been you know we have gone through the process and you know we we check the buildings and see how many buildings are accurate accurate means you know they are correct um, there are very minor or very medium type of changes we have to make and what are the buildings which are which are major and that way we were fairly you know we are evaluating the accuracy and we are seeing a notable noticeable improvement in the accuracy of the building capture over a period of time with that, we go into the LOD2 and LOD3, and what you are seeing on this slide is the, the top one is the LOD2, which is primarily extruded building with the roof type, and whereas LOD3 is full architectural, including windows, doors, etc. So <clears throat> when, we, when we talk about, so far, whatever we talked is about the geometry, then we talk about texture. How can we create the texture? There are different ways you can create the texture. One is the orthorectified imagery, but with the orthorectified imagery, you can capture the, the texture of the top of the roof only. Whereas with the oblique imagery, you can get the texture for the sides also. That's advantage of the oblique imagery. Geophotos is a technology or a method we have evolved ourselves using a handheld camera, capturing the building on the ground from multiple um, spots and then you create uh, the, the texture from the ground-based images. But again, this the geophotos will be very useful if you are going to do few buildings. But if, you are, if your job is to create the texture for an entire city or a downtown, then obviously you have to rely upon one of the, the, the oblique as well as the orthorectified imagery. So <clears throat> again, you know, the the, the capturing the texture source, you know, it has both the positive and negative aspects. We need to take into consideration the collection methods, cost, resolution, and the visual quality. The most important thing is the visual quality because ultimately that is what people are going to see. And so that, that's a very critical parameter. And this is one of the, the texture created using the computer generated texture. That's what I said. You can either create, it, create from the imagery or it can be uh, from the texture library. And you know, this is a classic case wherein we have created the texture. The, the rooftop has come from the ortho imagery. The sides have come from the oblique imagery. And uh, this, is, this is primarily from the imagery we captured the texture. And uh, this is about the ground level texture comparison wherein, as I said, we capture the images, uh, the buildings from multiple spots, and then we use a modeling method to create a photorealistic texture as shown in this uh, slide. And uh, there is one more thing I need to tell you here with regard to the texture. In a given project, you can combine both the, uh, the uh, texture created from the imagery as well as the texture available from the texture library. This is one of the examples wherein, uh, you know, these are all the two buildings where we have used the imagery for the texture, whereas, you know, in, in these cases, primarily we went through the attribute based texture or from the texture library. So that's, that is a possibility. You can combine the texture from the images as well as from the library. And this is the, the LOD4, which is primarily the interior mapping. This is the San Diego football team in, inside view, captured using a, 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 a LIDAR scanner inside. And again, there are different ways you can do the interior mapping. You know, you can gather the information from the building plans, digital blueprints, and modeling and LIDAR scanning. But you know, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of very involved job, not only the data collection, and then you, know, you need to clean up the data. And uh, you know there is there is a there is a certainly there is a, a good amount of level of effort is involved in the case of LOD four. So <clears throat> once uh, you know the, the this is uh, so far in the slides we talked about you know LOD zero to LOD four the geometry texture and all those things. The very first time the effort is a is a fresh creation. But what happens in our industry is we always have to go and do the update and maintenance. So when, it, when it's a question of update and maintenance process, and uh, you know, uh, we need to consider three parameters. One is the ability to edit the geometry, ability to edit the texture, and the ability to remove or edit the object. So all the three things we need to we need to keep in mind when we are doing the you know the update and maintenance process. And uh, <clears throat> the the question is, you know, in one of the thing is, you know, we can always create buildings from multiple sources, whatever I explained. Always the question is, what is the use case? There are plenty of use cases are there with regard to the, um, the buildings. And one of the, there are so many other things which are listed here, but uh, I would like to stress one thing here. This is one of the another important topic, the next gen 911 emergency response. Uh, one of the critical thing that we are seeing in the next gen 911 is the 3D buildings, uh, especially if you are having a high-rise building with the multiple floors and multiple rooms, 
and if a if a call comes from uh, from a cell phone people would like to know using the xyz values what is the floor and what is the room and to that level people would like to get the information so i think that's that is one of the uh, i would say the critical use case of a 3d building and of course there are so many other uh, areas you know including the transportation urban planning land use optimization and so on so forth and i think that the the, the buildings will always play a play a role and uh, with that i think i might have come to to the last slide and what you are seeing here is the sort of digital twin um, my, of my company has captured for the city of denver and uh, along with the other vector layers uh, so what you are seeing here is as uh, a sort of a video of the digital twin of uh, a small portion of the city of denver so while the while the video can run i believe i i have completed my presentation i hope i am on time um, and if uh, some more time is remaining i'm open to answer some questions perfect timing thank you so much uh we do have a couple minutes left i think we could squeeze in one or two questions jenna are there any questions i think you've stunned them <laughs> don't have, we don't have any questions in the live q a but uh, wow that was yeah. just amazing holy cow and i looking at the digital twin i'm just i'm i think i'm speechless <laughs> We gotta get this kind of footage for Arizona. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh. We'll just pause for a sec, see if any other questions have to come in. Okay. Actually, while we wait, I'll take a moment to shamelessly plug uh, LiDAR session two. Uh, you know, if you come back in an hour, We've got uh, the LiDAR session two, where we're gonna learn how we can use our iPhone or iPad as a LiDAR scanner. And we're gonna be looking at some uh, uh, open topo. We'll be here to talk about uh, three depth LiDAR topography. Um, and to keep you entertained between, uh, be sure to check out uh, the Exhibitor Expo at 2.30 right after this. And it is the always popular and always famous uh, group activity for trivia. Um, I'm assuming there's prizes this year. I haven't been paying that much attention, but there are. There I are. Have, I have Ajax swag for everyone. Ooh. So it's perfect. There um, we go. And... I would recommend dropping in on trivia night then or trivia afternoon. So any questions pop up in the in the no, oh. we've had wonderful comments though. Really, really slick right. is what folks have said. This is just amazing to watch. So very nice job. Um, I'd like to remind everyone to take the survey before you leave our session. Your feedback really helps us to improve our sessions. So, so I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you everybody for coming and we hope to see you again in, a, in an hour then, so.